guys, Caleb here, back again with more Red Knot. This time we are looking at The Silence of the Library by Miranda James, New York Times bestselling author of Out of Circulation. And the cover is cute, because in case you missed it, I love cats, and there's a kitty cat on the cover. It's so cute, the cat's reading books. And well, reading if you mean there's a book open sideways and that there's a moth on the book and the cat is actually after the moth. But anyway, a cat is in a room full of books, which I assume is a library, probably the Library of Silence. Now, I have several of these, uh, what would you call them, library cat books or what the uh, actual series name is but uh yeah about books and cats we are good i am okay with this it already has my approval i haven't even read this at all uh this was one these were one of the books i got mom christmas humor and plenty of southern charm oh it's also about the south so th there's three things that are that makes this book awesome already Cozy fans will hope James keeps Charlie and Diesel in action for years to come. Publishers Weekly. Oh, it's called The Cat in the Stacks Mysteries. Okay. I somehow missed that, even though it's clearly, like, in print here at the bottom. Whatever. Everyone in uh, Athena, Mississippi knows Charlie Harris, the librarian with a rescue Maine Coon cat named Diesel. He's returned to his hometown to immerse himself in books, but a celebrated author's visit draws an unruly swarm of fa uh, fanatic mystery buffs and one devious killer. It's National Library Week, and the Athena Public Library is planning an exhibit to honor the centenary of famous novelist, the centenary? I, I guess it's centenary. A famous novelist, Electra Barnes Cartwright, creator of the beloved Veronica Thane series. Charlie has a soft spot for Cartwright's girl detective stories, not to mention an extensive collection of her books. I don't know if that's proper, because normally when you do parentheses, you don't, you don't normally have, unless it's, unless it's, uh, concludes the, Basically, what's throwing me off is that in the parentheses is the little side note about how this person has a collection of this other person's books, and it's exclamation pointed. But then you have in parentheses, and then you have a period. I'm not sure parentheses works like that, but it's been a while since I reviewed my grammar, and I've never been w very good at grammar for anyone reading my current Fan fiction would know my grammar is pretty bad. I change tenses a lot. But anyway, when the author agrees to make a rare public appearance, the news of her whereabouts goes viral overnight, and series devotees and book, colle uh, book collectors converge on Athena. After all, it's rumored that Cartwright penned Veronica Thane stories that remain under wraps, and one rabid fan will stop at nothing, not even murder, to get a hold of the rare books. Praise for the Cat in the Stacks Mysteries A kind-hearted librarian hero and a gentle giant of a cat that will steal your heart. Lor uh, Lorna Barnett, New York Times bestselling author. A pleasing blend of crime and charm, Richard Times Dispatch. Acknowledgements. Please don't have a prologue. Oh, yes. Lightning tore through the sky, and a brilliant flash of light struck the ground near the road. Sparks flew, and a massive tree split and started to fall. The pert red rooster trembled as Veronica Thane urged it forward. Oh, roadster, not roots rooster. I was like, wait, a rooster? What? <laughs> uh, let's see, urged it forward. The huge oak threatened to land on her car and only the girl's swift reflexes saved her from sure annihilation. The car shot ahead as a section of a mighty tree struck the road behind it. Veronica Thane's hands... Shouldn't you just be like, her name's Veronica now, instead of Veronica Thane, whatever. 
Hands tightened on the wheel as she peeled through the sudden dulge of rain on her windscreen that rendered her all but blind. When another bolt of lightning briefly illuminated the dark sky, the interpret girl caught a glimpse of a, of a driveway ten feet ahead. Her heart thudded painfully as terror gripped her, but she called upon her deep reserve of fortitude and guided her roadster through the storm. Her breath coming in gas, she jerked the wheel to the right, and her car shot into the driveway at, at a fast clip. More lightning, now merciful mercifully farther away, offered her just enough light to see the dark hulking outlines of a mansion some distance away. Shelter lay before her! Yay! Though the wind swept trees that lined the drive, Veronica spotted dim lights in several windows. Now she had only to reach the house, and surely the residents would offer her refuge from the wild turmoil of the storm. The roadster shuddered to an abrupt halt as Veronica reached the impressive double front door. Lightning once again offered a fleeting look at the building that now loomed over her and rain pelted down as the light faded, but the plucky girl had uh, seen her goal. She thrust her door open and stepped into the tempest as she darted forward, suddenly dr instantly drenched. She, recall she recalled her handbag still in the roadster. Now there was no turning back. The girl pounded up the stairs of the portio that protected the massive front entrance. She raised the heavy ornate knocker, shaped like a gargoyle's monstrous head, and banged it against the heavy dark oak. Surely, despite the fury of the storm, someone within would hear her and invite her inside. I smiled as I closed the book and laid it next to me on the bed. I first, I first read the mystery at Spellwood Mansion over forty, over forty years ago when, on a rainy Sunday afternoon, I discovered my late aunt Dottie's collection of adventures of the adventures of Veronica Thane. I had finished my library books and was desperate for something to read, but the library was closed. <coughs> because you couldn't go to a bookstore and buy something. Aunt Dottie sent me to one of the spare rooms on the third... Oh, well, if you're in the past, uh, I guess as a kid you wouldn't have your own money to go do that. Uh, Aunt Dottie sent me to one of her spare rooms on the third floor and told me to search the bookshelves there. That's where I keep some of my treasures, Aunt Dottie had smiled as she shooed me out of the kitchen. Mind you, handle them gently. The words floated after me as I scurried away. Odd how certain memories linger. I recalled my headlong rush up the two flights of stairs and the moment when I turned on the light and, he and beheld a wall of books. How had I missed this room before? I don't know how long I stood and gazed at the hundreds of books, but I ended up seated on the floor in front of the shelves. My hands ran over the spines, all covered in dust jackets, and the titles in one section tantalized me with uh, words such as mystery, secret, clue, and terror. Finally, I stopped my fingers from roaming and pulled a book gently off the shelf. I examined the cover. A dark-haired girl stood under a tree in the foreground. Her eyes focused on a spooky-looking manor. The mystery at Spellwood Mansion stood out in bold letters, followed by a Veronica Thane mystery by Electra... Bar uh, Barnes Cartwright. I stretched down on the floor, opened the book, and began to read. From what I recall, I didn't move from the spot until I finished the book. By then, Aunt Dolly was calling me down for dinner. All I could talk about that evening was Veronica Thane, and Aunt Dolly joined in the conversation about her childhood favorite. After that, I always associated Aunt Dolly with Veronica and the other girl detectives whose adventure made up that amazing collection. Nancy Drew, the Dana Girls, Judy Bolton, Cherry Ames, Vicki Barr, Connie Blair, Penny Parker, and more besides. Then there were the Boy Sleuths, the Hardy Boys, Ken Holt, Rick Brant, and so on. Over the next several years, I worked my way through hundreds of those books before moving on to more adult fare, such as Sherlock Holmes, Hercule, Hercule Pi Pirot? Parrot? I am... 
failing so hard. And Henry got my days. Sorry for anybody who I just like murdered their favorite <laughs> their favorite stories. <laughs> their favorite heroes. Aunt Dolly uh, sparked my love of mysteries and fed it with a, her huge collection. I still had every one of her books, each too precious ever to let go. A large furry creature leapt onto the bed near my feet and interrupted my retrieve. My main coon cat, Diesel, chirped at me, determined to capture my focus, like cats do. Sorry to neglect you, boy, but I was reliving my youth for a few minutes there. I grinned as Diesel butted my head, still chirping. He loved attention, and he returned it with, uh, with often energetic affection. He climbed onto my legs, all thirty-six- Good God, why have you been feeding that cat? How is that cat that heavy? <laughs> mine's, mine's like ten pounds. Izzy and Chase both were ten pounds. <clears throat> he climbed onto my legs, all 36 pounds of him. Hang on a moment, boy, you're just a bit heavy. Yeah, I've had cats do that, and they, then they just stand there and like, what? Diesel, <coughs> Diesel muttered as I spread my legs. He slid between them and resettled himself, his head in my lap with his body stretched out. He purred loudly with a sound reminiscent of his namesake engine. With the cat comfortably in place, and myself reasonably so, I picked up my book, found my place, and delved into the story again. Lightning rent the sky once more, and the begaggled girl hur uh, hurled, huddled in the meager shelter of the porcio. She grasped the knocker, ready to knock a second time, when the door swung inward quickly and suddenly. She stumbled forward into the dimly lit foyer, because you just walk into somebody's house. You don't introduce yourself, you don't ask if you could come in, you just do it. Rabbit herself and turned to greet the person who admitted her, the door creaked shut. Veronica Thane shifted a gasp as her eyes beheld the cadaverous, elongated feature, figure of the ancient man who stood before her. He must be eighty years old, she thought, and well over six feet tall. Good afternoon, miss, the butler, for so, uh, for so he must be, as he wore the usual garb of such a servant spoke in a high, thin voice. The mistress will be pleased that you managed to arrive early, despite the storm. Veronica gasped. What could he mean? So you had an appointment, but it's... You forgot it or something? I don't know. A voice called my name, and I put the book aside with some reluctance. Isn't that how it always is? You're really getting into a book, and then everything in the world interrupts you? Rather, you're writing, you're reading, you're <coughs> watching a really interesting video or movie or something always shows up and it annoys the fuck out of you. Yes, Azalea, I'm here. I sat up and tried to disentangle <laughs> Diesel from my legs, but he wasn't interested in moving. I had to scoot myself backward a few inches, be <coughs> few inches before I was clear enough to swing one leg over him. When I tw then I twisted until I sat on the side of the bed. Oh, man. <laughs> Makes me think of having to uh, maneuver around my own cats. Izzy would always get in the exact center of the bed and would not move. And, that's, and I'm just like, Iz, how am I supposed to sleep? Like, I can't sleep with you right in the middle of the bed. You take up the whole bed right in the middle of the bed. <laughs> what are you doing all the way up there, Mr. Charlie? Azalea Berry, my housekeeper, frowned at me from the doorway. And what, and what you doing messing up that bed after I cleaned in here this morning? Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb things. I retrieved the book and tucked it under my arm before I stood. Diesel and I were just reading. I came up here to look for something and I got sidetracked by my, by the books. I just had to lie down and read for a few minutes. Azalea nodded as the ghost of a smile filtered by. Miss Dottie used to do that too. Sometimes I couldn't find her nowhere, and up here, and up here she'd be, stretched down on that bed, reading one of them books of hers. I glanced at the four poster, almost the four poster, almost as if I expected to see my lane aunt laying there. For a moment. I could have sworn I saw the dim outline of a person, but then when I blinked 
the image faded. Diesel warbled and rubbed against my leg. I wondered whether he sensed another presence in the room as I had. Yes, she loved her books. I showed the mystery at Spellwood Mansion to Azalea, and she glanced at the cover. This series was one of her favorites. What I, co what I came looking for. Actually, the, li the public library is doing a special exhibit for National Library Week next month, and it's going to feature the author. She would have been a... Uh, she would have been a hundred years old this year. Azalea preened at the book again. Miss Dotty loved those from when she was a little bitty thing. I reckon she told me about that Veronica girl a hundred times, how much she admired her when she was growing up. I felt a sudden lump in my throat as another memory surfaced from a conversation with my aunt when I was about twelve. I asked her why she didn't have any children of her own, and she told me she once had a little girl, but the angels came for her when she was only six months old and took her back to heaven with them. She had, na she had named her daughter Veronica. Azalea must have sensed my sudden discomfort, and Diesel did too. He warbled wildly and rubbed against my leg again as Azalea stepped back. As Azalea stepped back and motioned for me to follow her into the hall. I clicked off the light and shut the door behind us. You were looking for me, weren't you? I asked. Azalea nodded. Yes, sir. You had a phone call from that lady at the library, Miss... Miss Farmer. When I couldn't find you right away, I told her I'd get you to call her back soon as I did. Sorry it took so long to find me. I followed her down the stairs. Diesel at my heels. I'll go call her back right now. <coughs> Azalea continued down the stairs when we reached the second floor, but Diesel followed me into my bedroom, where I retrieved my cell phone from the nightstand. I speed dialed Teresa Farmer, director of the Athena Public Library. She answered right away. I identified myself, but before I could apologize for the delay, she spoke over me. <laughs> Charlie, you're not going to believe this. I heard the excitement bubbling in Teresa's voice. She's not dead. Before I could respond, Teresa repeated her last statement. She's not dead. Teresa found me looks mock, uh, flim moxed. Who's not dead? Sorry, Charlie. Teresa chuckled. Electra Barnes caught right. I found out she's still alive and apparently sharp as the proverbial tack. That's amazing, I sat on the bed, and Diesel hopped up beside me. She'll be a hundred on her birthday this year, whenever that is, whenever it is. That's right, I looked her up in Contemporary Authors. She'll be a hundred in May. How do you, how do you remember these things? One of my habits, storing away useless trivia, I laughed. There must be some connection between girls, mystery series, and longevity. Both Mildred, Rit Benson, and Margaret Sutton lived to be nearly a hundred. I know Benson wrote many of the early Nancy Drew books, Teresa said. Who was Margaret Sutton? Margaret Sutton? She wrote the Judy Bolton books. I don't remember reading those, Teresa said. They must not have gotten around when I first discovered and read books like that. Teresa, in her mid-thirties, was a good fifteen years younger than I and the Judy Bolton books were out of print by the time she came along. I mentioned this, and she laughed. Obviously, I've missed a good series. You'll have to tell me more about them later, because you probably know all there is to know about Judy Bolton. Otherwise, you wouldn't be advertising, advising us on our National Library Week exhibit. I picked up a fair amount of knowledge over the years about series books, such as Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. And I was delighted to put my seemingly arcane knowledge in uh, arcane knowledge to good use for once. Now back to Miss Cartwright. Teresa reclaimed my attention. I started noodling around the internet, came up with a number for an agent named Yancy Thickpin. Yancy Thickpin, and I thought I'd take a chance and call. What did you want from the agent? I asked. Unless you suspected that Electric Bane Cartwright was actually still alive. I thought that was unlikely, Teresa said. I was hoping the agent might know 
of any artifacts or special materials we could use for the exhibit i never dreamed she would tell me that the author was still living that's a wonderful surprise this whole thing so you couldn't like wikipedia it or something this is not something you could have found out on your own on the internet because usually uh, a big famous author or anybody like that is going to when they pass away it's going to be big news <clears throat> That's a wonderful surprise. This whole thing is coming together like it's truly meant to be. I can picture her bouncing in her chair, judging from the enthusiasm bubbling in her voice. Now for the really big news. Not only is she still alive, but Electra Barnes Cartwright lives nearby. How's that for amazing? I felt dazed. I knew she grew up around Calhoun City, a small town about a hundred miles from south of Athena. But from what little I remember reading about her, she left the South and settled in Connecticut when she was in her 20s. When did she come back to Mississippi? About 20 years ago, Yancey and Miss Cartwright lives quietly out in the country with her widowed daughter and grandson, between here and Minola. Did you know them? Marcella and Eugene Martyr. No, can't say I do. Diesel bumped his head against my arm to signal his need for attention. I rubbed my hand along his back as Teresa continued. Marcella has a library card, but I don't think she uses it much. But that's neither here nor there. One more awesome thing, she, she chuckled. When she didn't continue immediately, I said, Okay, out with it before I pop, pop a gasket here. If you aren't too busy tomorrow, Tessa responded, how'd you like to go with me to meet Electra Barnes Cartwright? I laughed briefly. I think you can figure out my answer. What time and where shall I meet you? We arranged to meet at the library a little before nine for an appointment at 9.30. The drive to the martyr home would make, would take only 20 minutes, 20 minutes at most. Bring Diesel along, uh, Teresa said. I asked whether Miss Cartwright would have any objection to a cat, and Yancey told me she loves animals. Besides, she's such a good icebreaker if we need one. He's such a good icebreaker if, he, if we need one. He's definitely that, plus he always seemed to know when he was being talked about because I noticed him staring intently at the phone. He chirped loudly several times, as if to tell me he would be happy to go along. Did you hear that? Teresa laughed. Yes, I did. He's given his approval to the visit, too. That sells it. See you tomorrow, I rang off and, slo and stowed my phone in my pocket. Come on, boy. Let's go downstairs and get something to eat. I set the, co I set the copy of the, the mystery at Spellwood Mansion on the nightstand for bedtime reading before I followed Diesel out of the room. The sky on Tuesday morning promised heavy rain, and the clouds grew darker as Teresa and I... Teresa and I stepped, uh, departed the library in my car. I checked the weather report last night, and the, for and the forecast gave only a 20% chance of rain. More like 80%, it seemed to me, as I examined the conditions. Diesel stretched out in the, bas in the back seat, his per ebasso continuo to her thoughts. Teresa pro uh, provided the directions, and I cast anxious eyes to the heavens as I drove. <laughs> <clears throat> the weather remained the eerie, the eerily, reminded me eerily of the opening scene in The Mystery at Spellwood Mansion. No lightning yet, but I had a feeling the distant rumble of thunder presaged plenty of it to come. Yancey said Miss Cartwright is a hoot to talk to, definitely knows her own mind, and isn't afraid to speak it. Teresa fiddled with the strap of the seatbelt across her chest, and I could tell the weather made her nervous as it did me. She's also pretty active, walks at least a couple miles a day unless the weather's bad or it's too hot. That's pretty amazing, better than I usually do, and I'm almost half her age. The sky continued to darken, and I switched on the car's lights. I preferred being safe inside uh, being safe inside during the storm, not out in a car right in the middle of it. Not much further, Teresa drew a deep breath, perhaps to calm herself, while Diesel had stopped purring and began muttering instead. He had obviously picked up on our unease over the weather, 
there should be a sign for uh, a sign for the be- for the board. Yard? Board? I'm not familiar with that word. The by road, I guess. She consulted her printer, her printed directions. It should say Applewood Hill Farm. I peered ahead as Rain suddenly pummeled, pummeled the car. I felt fur brush my slave arm as Diesel climbed over the center console and into Teresa's lap. Sorry about that, I said as I kept my gaze focused on the road. He doesn't like storms any more than we do. No problem, Teresa got the cat to settle. But at 36 pounds, he easily (laughs) overflowed her lap, and his tail rested across the console and next to my lap. It's okay, boy, she murmured in soothing tones, and Diesel's muttering slowed. There it is, the car's light shone on a large sign about 70 yards ahead, and I slowed for the approaching turn. The rain, fierce at first, began to decrease in volume, and I sent up a thankful prayer that the storm seemed to be moving quickly over us. From here it should only be about... That was weird. <laughs> From here it should only be about two miles. Teresa peered out... Uh, Teresa peered at her directions while Diesel's tail twitched in my lap. Then there's a driveway on the left, and the house is about 400 yards up the driveway behind a stand of trees. The sky lightened as we headed down the by-road, and the rain continued to slacken. <clears throat> there seemed to be no other houses close to the road, though I spotted three driveways before we reached one one on the left. A small sign about two feet by four boasted Master Family Farm in faded gothic lettering. This is it, I pointed the car down the driveway, and moments later we drove... Wait... Applewood Hill Farm. Okay, whatever. Doesn't make sense because we're supposed to be looking for Applewood Hill Farm, but then suddenly we're at Martyr Hill, Martyr Family Farm. Uh, uh, down the driveway, and moments later we drove through a stand of pine trees. On the other side, the drive swept up a slight rise to circle in front of a rambling two-story farmhouse. I figured it had been built sometime between the two world wars, with maybe a few additions along the way. A wide porch extended across the front of the house, which faded which faced south, and around on the western side as well. There were a couple of porch swings and three chairs. Light gleamed dimly in a win- in a window to the west of the front door. Rain sprinkled down as I parked the car, and I debated whether to bother with an umbrella. Hang on to Diesel for a moment till I can get around to pick him up. He didn't like getting his pads wet, so I would carry him up to the porch. Once I had Diesel in my arms, I let Teresa scurry uh, up the walk ahead of us. Under the cu- under cover of the porch, I put the cat down and stood aside as Teresa pulled open the screen door to knock on the wooden door behind it. After a moment, Teresa knocked again. The seconds later, the door swung open to reveal a short, heavy set woman who appeared to be in her late sixties or early seventies. She scowled at the side of Teresa and said, "What are you doing here?" Thunder crashed, and I jumped as the rain poured down once again. What was wrong with this woman? We needed to get inside and out of the storm. I was thankful we had avoided getting soaked as we scurried from the car onto the porch. But if the wind picked up again, we would soon be dripping. I beg your pardon, Teresa stepped back from the door, obviously confused. When I spoke to you yesterday, you said this morning would be fine. Her posture rigid and her expression suspicious. The woman stared at Teresa a moment. She reached forward. She reached toward the wall inside the door, and the porch light flicked on. The woman's face relaxed, and she flashed a brief smile. I'm sorry. I couldn't really see who, see who you were. She stood aside and motioned for us to enter. I thought you were. That um salesman I talked to the other day. He just won't leave me alone trying to sell me uh, life insurance. I followed Teresa inside, and Diesel almost got tangled in between my legs in his haste to enter the house. 
I managed not to stumble and move out of the way. The woman closed the door behind us. I was grateful to be out in the storm, but a bit skeptical of our would-be hostess' explanation of her earlier root of her earlier rude words to Teresa. She didn't sound particularly convincing, especially since Teresa in no way resembled a salesman. It wasn't that dark on the porch. The woman's eyes widened as Diesel stretched and, warb and warbled in greeting. I'm Marcina, Marcella Martyr, Miss Cartwright's daughter. She continued to stare at my, at my boy. What kind of cat is that? I surely don't think I ever saw one that big before outside of a zoo. She brayed like a frightened donkey, her vision, her version of a laugh, I suppose, and startled the rest of us. Diesel drew back with a jerk, and I patted his head in reassurance. His name is Diesel, and he is a Maine Coon, the oldest natural breed of domestic cat in the U.S. They tend to be larger than other breeds, but Diesel here is well above average in, si in the size department. When he heard his name, the cat warbled again as he looked up at me. And then at Miss Martyr. Miss Martyr. It's almost like he's talking. Again, Miss Martyr emitted that raucous laugh, and Diesel shifted back against me. He's a beautiful thing. Mother will eat him up with a spoon. I'm Teresa Farmer, and this is Charlie Harris. We're really looking forward to meeting Miss Cartwright. Teresa spoke in a firm tone as Miss Martyr had made no move to take us beyond the front hall. Our hostess nodded. Sure thing. Y'all come on through. Mother's having a good day, and I know she's anxious to talk to you. She turned and headed down the hallway that divided the house. As we followed her, I glanced around and noted that the hard uh, that the hardwood floor there, where it wasn't covered by shag rugs, shone with polish. The house had a pleasant smell, a light tang of citrus in the air. Whoever did the cleaning here appeared to be as miraculous as Azalea. Thunder boomed directly over the house, or so it seemed, and the building shook. Diesel mewed, mewed anxiously, and I paused to calm him with a hand on his head. Teresa and Miss Martyr continued down the hall ahead of us and turned into a room on the left near the end of the corridor. I stepped into the doorway with Diesel by my legs, and I paused to get my first glimpse of my childhood idol the room ablaze with light enough to make me blink, and several seconds passed before my eyes began to adjust. In addition to the overhead fixture, I I counted seven lamps placed around the large sitting room, all glowing. The effect reminded me of family outings to the beach in Galveston with the summer sun that blazed without mercy. The glare was intimidating at first, and the resulting heat stifling. I could already feel the sweat on my forehead, and I knew my slightly damp clothing ought to dry quickly. I suppose, like many elderly people, Miss Cartwright liked the heat, but all these lights seemed an odd way to keep her warm. Once I was able to focus, I spotted the reason for our visit ensconed on a sofa to my right, and my heart raced. This was a thrill I never expected to have. I absorbed as many details as I could without appearing rude. Electric Barnes Cartwright, at nearly a century of life, appeared thin, but not unhealthily so, clothed in trousers and a heavy carnigan over a collared, bl collared blouse, neck swathed in a scarf. She looked ready for an outing. Dark glasses protected her eyes from the light, and her henned hair surprised me. I expected, I realized, a fluffy, white-haired lady. The electric Cartwright didn't project that image. Mother, the, here are those nice people from the library in Ath Ath Athena that we talked about. Miss Martyr moved to within three feet of her parent and stood, hands clasped, in front of her. She waited until Miss Cartwright nodded before she made the formal introductions. Nice to meet y'all, Miss Cartwright. <clears throat> Miss Cartwright had a rasp in her voice, like that of a hundred of a hardened smoker, especially this four legged gentleman. Aren't you beautiful? Diesel evidently agreed <laughs> because he moved closer to her outstretched hand and warbled three times. 
Miss Cartwright laughed as she stroked the cat's head. Diesel likes attention, I noted the I noted the ha happy smile Miss Cartwright wore as she continued to lavish attention on the cat. He is not conceited, Miss Cartwright said. He is simply con convinced, aren't you, sir? She looked up at me, her her hand finally finally still atop Diesel's willing head. You're a fortunate man to have such a wonderful companion. Thank you, ma'am. I ducked my head in acknowledgement. He was brought he has brought me considerable joy he has brought considerable joy to my family and me. Marcella, where are our manners, Miss Cartwright Tart Miss Cartwright's tart tone took me aback, especially when Miss Martyr twitched into action and shoved a chair at Teresa. Please pardon my daughter, Miss Cartwright continued. We don't get many visitors these days, and our company ma and our company manners sure aren't what they used to be. That was an understatement, I thought. The relationship between mother and daughter appeared tense, and that made me feel uncomfortable. Thank you. After a swift glance to me, Teresa nodded at Miss Marner, and she sat down. I found another chair and pulled it near. In the meantime, Miss Cartwright patted the empty space beside her on the sofa and indicated that Diesel should join her. He glanced at, he glanced my way first as if he sought permission. When I nodded, he climbed up beside Miss Cartwright and settled his head and front legs on her, in her lap. My eyes teared up every other minute or so from the intense light, and I wished mildly for a pair of sunglasses. This quirk of Miss Cartwright's made the room unpleasant for visitors, but I suppose that if I made it to the century mark, I ought to be allowed a few quirks. We really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us, Teresa leaned forward to address Miss Cartwright. As your daughter might have told you, we are featuring you and your work in exhibit for our upcoming National Library Week festivities next month. It was certainly a stroke of luck to find to find out that you were living so near Athena. Miss Cartwright laughed. That I'm still alive and kicking is what you really mean. I know that little fact will be a shock to some. She glanced at her daughter, who hovered behind Teresa. Miss Martyr frowned at her mother before she turned and left the room. <coughs> Miss Cartwright called after her daughter, bring us something cold to drink. She focused on Teresa. Exactly what are you going to do for the festivities? Primarily an exhibit of your life and works, highlighting the fiction you wrote for children and young adults. Teresa nodded in my direction. For example, thanks to his late aunt, Charlie has been an amazing collector of the Veronica Thane series. He has offered to let the library borrow items from it for the, collect for the exhibit. Miss Cartwright stroked Niesel's back with her right hand. Your aunt is a reader of mine. Yes, ma'am, she was, I said. She passed away several years ago, but she left her house and all of its contents to me. She has a superb collection of juvenile mysteries like the Veronica Thane series, her personal favorite, along with others like Nancy Drew and Judy Bolton. Miss Cartwright snorted and startled Diesel into meowing. That dratted Nancy Drew... She was the bane of my existence. I know my Veronica books could have sold even better if the, if the syndicate if the syndicate hadn't interfered. Teresa cast me a bewildered glance, no doubt thrown by the reference to a syndicate, and the the toily in our hostess tone. I presume you're talking about the the Stromiser syndicate. I smiled, and Teresa's face cleared. I had given her the basic history of Edward Stratzmeyer, Stratzmeyer, Stratmeyer, and his fiction factory when we first discussed our ideas for the Cartwright exhibit. Miss Cartwright scowled. Just hearing that name makes my blood pressure go up. I was lucky enough not to work for him or receive the hack wages he paid. And the stories I heard from other writers who did and had to work with those daughters of his, he glanced at me, but I realized that I was not the target of her evident wrath. I believe I read an article once that other non-syndicate writers complained that the syndicate tried to get their 
their series squashed and they wouldn't compete with Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. For example, those co- those claims, I, I reasoned at the time, might have been nothing more than the proverbial sour grapes due to the phenomenal success of Nancy and the, Hardy, and the Hardys. But I didn't really know for sure. Miss Cartwright naturally had a right to her own opinion on the matter. <coughs> I could tell you plenty. The elderly author shook her head. But there's no point to it now. Everyone else con- uh, concerned is long gone. She flashed a sudden grin. I about lived them all. Teresa addressed Miss Cartwright. You and your work will be the focus of this exhibit. I want to assure you of that. We'll have examples of the other girl detectives, but you and your books are the centerpiece. That's good. If I've got pride of pride of place, then I don't mind sharing. Miss Cartwright laughed again. What other plans did you have besides the exhibit? That was the sum of it originally, Teresa said. But with your being so close by, we wondered whether you would be interested in some kind of public appearance. Meet my adoring fans, you mean, Miss Cartwright laughed. Sure, I'd love to do that. Haven't actually talked to one of them face to face in years. Had plenty of letters, though. That's terrific, I said. One idea I had was a public interview. You wouldn't have to give a speech, unless, of course, you want to. More along the lines of my interviewing you in front of an audience. Give them a chance to listen, perhaps ask a few questions of their own at the end. I think I'd like that. Less wear and tear on me. Count me in. Miss Cartwright smiled, obviously pleased. It would be lovely to see a room full of my readers. Absolutely not. That's a terrible idea. Marcella and Marcher plunked a tray of drinks down on a nearby table and glared at her mother. I absolutely forbid it. Well, at least this time we got to some semblance of a mystery instead of just being told a bunch of information, even though we were told a bunch of information. I'm interested enough to keep reading, but nothing's really gripped me about the story. Aside from, it's about books, it's about a cat, or at least the cat's a part of it, and that's about it. Characters, I I don't know. I don't really feel an attachment to characters. I'm just kind of like, what characters? There's some people here and they're talking, but they don't really, aside from the main the main character it doesn't really feel like anybody's got a personality and even then i couldn't really call it a personality just learn some history about him and then he really likes books and he's got fond memories of books and of his aunt and he likes his cat the cat's got some personality of course all cats have personality so i can keep reading it but there's just doesn't really seem to be anything there that I feel attached to that would get me to keep reading. We've introduced the characters, we've set up uh, an idea, and then we've started to go about the idea, but nothing's really happened yet other than we're starting to see that there's Seems to be an issue between daughter and mother, which, you know, it's okay. You don't have to have murder or anything happen in the first three chapters, but typically you want to introduce all of the characters as well as the villain by chapter three. You don't have to say who the villain is, but that's the typical rule of thumb I've learned in my writing classes. You, inter- if especially if you're writing a mystery, you introduce the main villain by chapter three. Go in by this, and it's probably likely a red herring at this point, but it seems like the daughter's supposed to be the antagonist. Probably more likely a red herring, as I said. But I, I don't have. Other than I have no attachment to anything, and nobody really seems to have their own personality, I don't really have anything against the book. I'll I'll probably continue reading it, um, but that'd be about it. I'm Caleb, and this has been Red Knot. Thank you for listening. Bye!